Uh, ben C. Ben is a literature teacher, but he also teaches his students about ecological emergency activism. He joins us now from Paris. Ben, thank you so much indeed for your time. Okay, you know these things already because you're an expert in this field. This decade is almost certain to be the hottest on record. That's according to the World Meteorological Organization. Last year, Australia's bushfires destroyed 80,000 hectares of national parkland in New South Wales alone. So far this year, since July, 10 times that amount has already been destroyed. You tweet about these things regularly. I follow you on Twitter because of the things I learn about the climate crisis, but how much more can you be an activist while the world's leaders don't appear to be listening? Does it not dishearten you? Oh no, it doesn't dishearten me at all actually. I'm, I'm very optimistic about political possibilities even though things may appear relatively difficult at the moment politically. Uh, human beings are capable of all sorts of extraordinary change and in fact if you think about it through history um, change is a constant, a flux is always there. So I'm very optimistic about political possibilities. Um, what I'm not so uh, optimistic and positive about is the uh, scientific reality. The science looks very, very, very grim. Um, and I have no real optimism with the science. I certainly don't have any hope with the science. But yes, I think change is absolutely possible. Yes, but it's obviously down to governments to enact the changes that will reverse the science because at the moment the science is saying that we're heading for these disasters that are coming if we don't take action right now. An example comes from the Arctic where Vladimir Putin last year signed a decree that boosts Russian traffic through the Arctic where the ice is melting at a record rate. And so Russia's president is taking advantage of climate change, but surely those actions of sending more ships through the Arctic is only going to worsen the situation. The Arctic is a very particular part of the world where the climate crisis has hit severely. Yes, I mean, I, I must say that I think that there are... Um, we have an opportunity now to actually vote in uh, new governments uh, who are uh, willing to um, put in place uh, a Green New Deal in the UK uh, and also in the US. And so um, if we think about governments having to take action, well, we have the opportunity to vote those new governments in very soon, and we absolutely must do that. Um, although I must uh, slightly um, disagree on the idea that uh, if we don't take action, there will be a catastrophe. Uh, the catastrophe is well underway. Um, ecological catastrophe is happening now. Uh, rainforests are so fragmented that I don't really know if they're going to be able to withstand the um, sudden rapid warming uh, that comes in the 2020s. Um, I feel there's a, every chance they're going to collapse no matter what we do. And so it means that we must take action. Um, it's even more urgent knowing that it's possible that no matter what we do, we won't be able to stop certain tipping points. And uh, um, the Arctic is a very good example of that. So I'm not sure if we should be thinking about individual leaders only and individual countries only. The discourse is very much around that. I think we should be looking at systems as well, um, corporate systems particularly, and the damage that they are doing. Um, and that's why Greta is so useful and wonderful in terms of the way that she looks at things. She um, talks about the need for a new economics, a new politics in terms of climate justice, uh, in terms of the global north, um, reducing emissions immediately to zero. Uh, for example, in the 2020s, I think that has to happen. And then to finance uh, safe energy uh, in the global south. Um, so the Arctic then, yes, it's a uh, it's an important part of a complicated, complex picture of ecological collapse. You know, scientists recently talking about a climate emergency, uh, it's an ecological emergency too. I am often worried about the fact that insects are disappearing off the planet and recently entomologists have agreed that yes, many studies show that um, there is a, an absolutely appalling decline um, in the number of insects and the type of insects. And of course, when you think about pollinators, we need insects. Um, the Arctic is a problem because the Arctic sea ice is uh, going to disappear. I mean, it's not going to not disappear, it's going. And uh, models suggest it's going to happen between sort of 2030, 2050. But the um, 
the consensus science models of the IPCC, they're very useful, they're very important, but they're not very good at modeling sea ice in the Arctic. So I think it's going to disappear in the 2020s. And uh, that's going to lead to what well, I could read you here. Look, um, the Arctic is heading toward irreversible melting and ecosystem destruction. That's the NOAA. Uh, the Arctic has entered an unprecedented state that threatens global climate stability. And what's going to happen is we're going to be looking at crop failures. I think that's the most important thing for us to be talking about. I don't think we're really talking about it at all. Um, massive, unprecedented, perhaps simultaneous crop failures, particularly in the northern hemisphere because of the changes in the jet stream. And I must say, I, I'm not an expert, and I would encourage everyone to feel that they can talk about this stuff without being an expert. I, I've read a lot about it because I'm interested. Uh, my expertise is literature. You know, we should be talking about Shakespeare, really. <laughs> uh, I would encourage everybody, your viewers and everybody, um, to get involved and understand uh, the science and understand the political sort of um, implications of things. Anyone can, can get involved and, and think about this and talk about it because, you know, the, the reality is almost unthinkable, but we, we must think about it. Sure. And it's the, the, the threat of billions of lives being in danger, it's an unspeakable thought, but we must, we must speak up. You, so, ben, um, ben, you mentioned... That's, that's my vision of things. Uh, you mentioned yeah. crop failures, that's depressing. You mentioned the state of the Arctic, that's depressing. You mentioned the loss of pollinators and insects yeah. going extinct, that's depressing. Uh, there's a graphic that shows uh, a swathe of the world, and you take probably the UK as the northern point and just the tip of Australia as the southern point, and a huge swathe of the planet Earth that is eventually going to become uninhabitable if we don't take the actions that are needed. All of that is depressing. How do you teach your students about the facts that are out there without scaring them too much? Because if we scare the youth, that's not what we want to do. We want to get them out there and encourage them to be positive rather than depressed about the future. Of course, so this has been a question that's been ongoing for a number of years. Um, and I think it's important to tell people and children the truth of the situation. Um, the planet we think we're living on no longer exists, and I think they deserve to know that. It's not right that we don't tell them what's going on. So um, it has been suggested that you don't understand this crisis if you're not terrified. But you're right, I don't want my pupils to be depressed and terrified. So I explained to them that um, one of the best ways to uh, feel OK about this extraordinary and difficult uh, moment in human history is to do exactly what we're talking about and take action. I always feel better when I take action. I feel good when I'm talking to you, knowing that you are willing, uh, someone in the media, actually willing to talk about this stuff. Because let's face it, uh, in, on the TV uh, and in newspapers, we get a certain amount of information, but it takes uh, a lot of diligent um, tenacity to put all the different pieces together and see the, the sort of bigger picture of the fact that we're going to hit 1.5 degrees by about 2029, 20, 2030, and 2 degrees uh, not that long after that. And that's a rate of climate change which has um, not been seen in uh, 65 million years. A rate of climate change that's not been seen in 65 million years, that's insane. But I think pupils are very willing to talk about it. I talk about it to my pupils uh, when I can, because I'm meant to be teaching literature most of the time, of course, and I, I weave it into what I do, and they like to talk about it. They're fascinated. And I explained to them, I, I spoke to a pupil two days ago, I think, or yesterday, and she said, you know, it's difficult coming to school because we never get the impression that we can really change anything. We, we mm. get the impression that things are just going to stay the same. Mm. That is the critical thing. We must have a vision of the world and a kind of a philosophy that reminds us that human beings are ultimately very decent. You know, we're, we, are, we are created in terms of love. You know, our parents love us and we love them back and communities help each other. And this is actually the norm. And of course, there's dysfunction and there's anger and fear and hatred and things like that which can make, make things difficult. There are political realities today which are disturbing and distressing. But young people must feel that there's an opportunity to limit the damage um, that we see and to not uh, become, as you say, depressed by the, uh, the raft of uh, difficulties that we, that we see today. Ben, the reason we're leading with this story about the climate crisis is because as someone recently observed that whatever else is happening in the world, the death and destruction that's taking place, it's all just moving chess pieces around the board compared to the climate crisis. Ben, thank you so much indeed for joining us on TRT World. Hugely appreciated. If you want to follow Ben on Twitter, at Climate Ben is the place to look.